right so in this section we're going to have a look at the actual hardware now so what's actually inside the uh, device so we're going to have a look at the hardware architecture and then we'll have a bit more at the power side so we'll have a bit more at the PMIC side of the uh, device as well so the separate chip so for the hardware itself traditional MCUs which is what ST has been um, developing and creating for many many years now everything's embedded inside one physical chip so the RAM the flash and all the power control for the regulators power in the memory things like that has all been embedded in one chip for the MPUs it's all slightly different so your flash is external your DDR is external so you have some so much SRAM internal but most of the things are done in the DDR and you have the, this external power management IC so the PMIC the architecture has sort of evolved a lot more compared to the MCU world that we're very familiar with within the ST. So the block diagram, so we've got our dual core A7, so this is for the 157 device, so the, the largest member. So we've got our dual core A7 with the two types of cache, so you've got level one cache and I think level two cache inside there. They sit as a separate block. Another separate block is the Cortex M4 side. So that again has its own memory protection unit and floating point unit. So it's a standard Cortex M4, can do all the DSP extended architecture, things like that, and with the floating point math. So you can use the M4 for quite a lot of um, functionality inside there. And over on the right, we have all the graphics. And providing the memory for all that is sat here in the middle of the uh, diagram. So you've got the DDR3s, it's standard DDR3 or LP DDR. And then we've got all the internal memories. So the system SRAM, the MCU SRAM, the backup SRAM, things like that. So there's lots of internal RAMs inside the device that are segmented for different functionalities. So each of them has its own particular item to do inside the device. As it is an ST product, so it's an STM32 product, all the control and connectivity that you expect around an STM32 microcontroller is also in this device. So down here, we've got all the timers. So you've got 32-bit timers, 16-bit timers, advanced motor control timers, all those are still inside the device. We've got our analog cell, so you've got ADCs running at 3 mega samples a second on 22 channels. So again, you can do lots of analog functions. You've got DACs inside the device. So again, all the functionality that you would have had on the M4 is still available on the M4 that's built in here or the A7, depending on what you want to assign it to. For connectivity, as you can see, this is a very large block. So you've got all the standard STM32 connectivity, so SPIs, I2Cs, UARTs, Ethernet, USBs. But some of the peripherals have been advanced because of the performance you've got. So we're now on gigabit Ethernet inside the device, rather than standard 10100 on all other STM32s. You've got the USB hosting functionalities. So you've saw it's on the board already. So you've got the four USB ports there as hosts. You've still got the standard OTG device inside there, so for full speed and high speed, but you've got the hosting abilities inside there. And you've got a lot, a few more other higher speed, higher performance peripherals. Um, so the MIPI DSIs, the camera interface, the HDMI controllers, all those extra pieces are inside the device. Connecting all this together, as you can probably gather, is quite a bit of a task internally inside the device. So we have two different memory buses inside. So we've got a high-speed AXI bus, which is the pink line. And then we've got an, a slightly slower speed AHB bus. As I say, there's not much difference in the speeds. As Chris highlighted earlier, each peripheral can work with both cores. The reason we've segmented it like that is certain peripherals are more optimized to work with the A7, and some are more optimized to work with the M4 due to the nature of each peripheral. So it's, it's been separated out a bit. But as you can see, there is two connections at the top here. So if you do want the Ethernet working with the M4, you can do. So it can be routed through the connections there into the M4. All right, you won't get gigabit Ethernet, but you can still have standard 10100 Ethernet running with the Cortex M4 inside the device. For system and security, so these are the two sections I missed out on the um, block diagram earlier on. You've got all your standard clock control that you'd expect, so you've got internal RCs and the ability to put external um, crystals or modules onside the device. You've got the different power modes, 
that you can put the device into, so there's a lot of power control still going on inside the device. And you can still have external interrupts, so be it either onto the A7 or the M4, you can have external physical interrupt pins going into the device. So that part is pretty much the same as the M4 side, but available to the A7 as well. DMA wise, so there's multiple DMAs. So we have a master DMA, which is more associated to the A7, and then we've still got the standard DMA1, DMA2, which is more familiar if you've done anything with Cortex-M based devices. OTP fuses, so if you want to store uh, MAC addresses, serial numbers, version numbers, things like that, so we have some OTP fuses available for you. They are used for other features as well, so some of them are for user functionality. So we'll highlight some of those uh, later on, where you can put certain items in to configure part of the system. But other, item, other parts of the OTP fuse is available for you to program. And on the security side, first one is the extended trust zone, so which is part of the A7 and provides the protection and access to certain peripherals only and a particular method of accessing those peripherals. So if anyone tries to hack into your system, tries to jump into somewhere that's secure in the memory, then if you've not followed the correct entry procedure and things like that, it'll generate a reset or an error message inside the system. So for the basic security, you've got the OTP fuses where you can secure items, you've got the electronic signatures and things like that. Tamper pins, so I think you've got up to three tamper pins on this device. And the tamper pins will protect what you store in the backup registers and you can also generate in arrays for the backup SRAM, which I think is the 64K part, I think. No, that's retention RAM. Sorry, retention RAM is 64K, backup RAM is 4K, and there are some backup registers that are dedicated. So if you've got cryptography keys installed, you will save them in the backup registers, which are automatically erased when a tamper happens. And other vital information you will store in the backup RAM, which can be erased. It's your choice. You set it up to erase the backup RAM if a tamper detection goes off. And then if you send in outbound transmissions, you've still got the standard cryptographer AES-128-256 uh, available to inside the device. So the memories. So as I said, there's a, a section of internal memory and most items happen in the external memory. So the boot ROM is programmed by ST in the factory. So you can't influence that at all. It's hard coded inside the chip. This is 128K and will get your device up and running. So it does some basic functionality to configure device. In association with the boot pins, which we'll show you later, I'll show you what the boot ROM's capable of doing. Then you've got the SRAMs. As I said, it's all segmented into different areas. So we've got the backup SRAM, which is the 4K, which can be maintained if you want to have a low power base system on a VBAT pin. You've got the retention RAM. This is 64K. This is primarily used for the message buffers for the intercommunications between the two cores. So between the M4 and the A7 side. So all these message buffers when you're transferring messages up are set up inside this retention RAM. Then we've got the system RAM, which is 256K. So that's for the use of the A7 side. And then you've got the rest of the SRAM, the 384K, that's for the use of the Cortex M4 for your code and your data. So the M4 has no flash, it's all run out of SRAM. So that's all part of the 384K inside there. So you can see there that all these memories can be accessed by all the cores, with the exception of the M4 has no access to the boot ROM. So the A7 has to boot first, not the M4. Then off-chip memories, so you've got your DDR, which is your standard interface. We highlighted that you can connect it to the M4, but we're highlighting there, it's not recommended. You will get a performance penalty on your A7 if you try and use your M4 to read things from the DDR interface, mainly because you have to slow it down so much for the M4 to actually do the read, so it runs too fast. Then you've got all the other memory interfaces, so MMC, Quad SPI, and external memory bus, so FMC for NOR and NAND flash. So all of these can be used for any of the cores, Again, we don't recommend doing execute in place for things like the Quad SPI for the M4 again, because it's, again, it will slow the performance down of the A7 if the A7 is using the Quad SPI interface as well. So, but it can be used, but not really for execute in place. For the DDR, depending on which package will depend on which type of memory you can use. 
So if you're on the two larger pin packages, you can have a 32-bit interface DDR. If you're on the two smaller pin count packages, then you will be limited to a 16-bit DDR interface. So again, as Chris highlighted, depending on which sales type you use, which board layout you use, will also govern which type of DDR chip interface you can use as well. Memory map for the MP1, it's ARM standard layout. You've got up to, um, what is it? X amount of gigabytes, so up to FF, 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 FF. All the peripherals are dotted around. SRAM is down at the bottom around 2 million hex or 20 million hex. Uh, the boot's right down at zero. And then each of the peripherals are in their normal defined areas that ARM have um, quantified of where certain types of memories have to sit in the address range. So there's no different there. It's all uniform addressing for all the areas. So there's no remapping going on. There's just a split there between which core can see what uh, down at the bottom, but everything else is in uniform mapped and that. So the power side. So for the power side of the micro, there's a lot of power pins on the MP1, all of them powering different parts of the circuitry. We've got three real mandatory supplies. So you've got to provide a power for your VDD to DDR. So this is internal to chip, not to the memory. This is the voltage that your DDR is going to be running at. The micro also needs to know what voltage that memory is running at. So the same voltage to your DDR chips has to also come inside the microcontroller. Then we have the voltage for the core, and it's providing uh, all the power to all the core domain. And then we have the main voltage, which is providing the rest of the device, like the I.O. rings, all the peripherals and things like that. So they're the three particular voltages that you have to specify into the device. As I said, there's lots of other voltage pins, so there's analog pins as well that will need the voltages. Most of those will be the same as the standard VDD but you have the option of changing VREF plus depending on what type of analog signals you want to uh, try and measure externally with the device. And inside you've also got different power domains. So we have the core domain, the main VDD domain, the switching domain, so when you're switching from VBAT to battery backup, and back to mains again, and all the analog side of things. So these are all the elements that you have to worry about when it comes to powering the MP1. So you've got two solutions. A lot of the time, it'll be application dependent on which of these solutions you're going to go for. So if you're on a very simple project that's just got a NOR flash, DRAM, and the micro, you might decide discrete power is probably still the most efficient, most cost sensitive way to go. So you've only got to generate free rails for the device. You don't have to do much playing around. You're not plugging in lots of other items into your target board. So discrete will be the way around. For pretty much all other applications where you've got USBs, um, displays, other heavy um, interfaces like Ethernet, Wi-Fi, things like that, then the PMIC will save you a lot of time. So inside the PMIC, we have all the different power controllers for the MP1. And then we've got lots of other LDO to power all your periphery devices. So if you're plugging lots of USB devices in and powering those USB devices, you'll need some power switches, things like that. If you've got the DDR memory, which is powering there, you also power the DDR. And then if you want to power the Ethernet 5, things like that, you've got lots of other LDOs down there to power different items on your target board. And all you do is put in a 3.3 .3 to 5 volt supply into this PMIC, and it will manage the rest. When it comes to low power modes, remember you have a communications channel between the micro and the PMIC, so you can shut things down inside the PMIC if you do need to go into power saving modes. So, so you've got nice flexibility and control over what the PMIC's doing. So internally, you have all your power regulators powering the device. So powering the supply into the DDR and then also powering the physical DDR chips externally. And then inside here, you've got the power management, which is powering all the particular cores inside and then sending some control information back to the PMIC to uh, balance things out, switch things off as you see fit inside. So for power modes, there are multiple things to think about. So this is the system power mode. So this is everything. 
you'll see things also called C run, C stop. So that's the core one. So that's individual for each of the cores. So there'll be a C run and C stop for the A7 and the M4. So this is for the whole system. So you can run, stop and stand by and then pretty much go on to VBAT with inside the system. Clocks will only ever go in run. Then stop mode means you've stopped all the clocks to the, both the cores, not just one of the two cores. A standby means you've uh, switched off your voltage to your cores completely. Uh, and then VBAT will give you the lowest power modes that we've got available on the device. So the power consumption figures. So if you're in run mode with both cores running and the M4 running, you're about 350 milliwatts. Then if you switch off one of the two A7s or you're on the 151, you'd be about 275. And as I say, you can then drop your two A7s into sleep mode or stop mode and just keep your M4 running and you're down to 92 milliwatts. So again, depending on what you're doing in your application, you've got control over this on the fly. It's your decision to uh, switch the power modes. Then if you drop down into standby, you're down at about 36 microwatts. Remember, this is the chip only, not including the DRAM, DDR in self-refresh. This is just the chip. And then if you drop into VBAT, you're about four and a half microwatts. So it can do a proper low power based application. Even though you've got that high performance when you're fully powered, you can go into some low power modes inside here. So we have a dedicated application note for power consumption. So that's on the web and that'll help you with the power management side of things. As well as the power management one and the low power modes, We've also got the standard hardware getting started guide. So how you're connecting all the clocks, the reset side and the, um, the power information. So we've got a dedicated hardware getting started manual, exactly the same as we have for every STM32. We've got the low power modes one. We've got the uh, discrete power supply hardware integration. So if you're not using the PMIC, we've got an application note on how to do a discrete one. Because again, the power rails have to come up at the right speeds. So there is a bit of power management needed to be going on inside discrete. And there's lots of information in this reference manual. I think it's about 4,000 pages long, the reference manual. So there's a lot in there. As I say, we'll keep referring you to the wiki because it's a lot easier to work with, but you do have that hard copy if you don't want to go reading through the reference manual. If you need some bedtime reading, go for the reference manual. So there's some of the other um, power consumption numbers that we've got, depending on which of the different modes you're in for the MP1 chip.